Hello, my name is Neha and you're watching this video on the Pratyansha channel. This is the second video for the poem Michael by William Wordsworth. If you haven't watched the first video, pause this video right now, go to the description box, click on the link, watch the first part and then come to the second video. In the first part, we studied that how William Wordsworth sets up a beautiful stage where he takes us to the exact location where Michael lives. He talks about the location, he talks about the beauty of that place and he also tells us that Michael as a shepherd is living in this particular place and is running the course of his life. The first part, like I said, largely set up the stage and ended where the author starts to describe Michael as a very strong man, a man devoted to his occupation. In the second part now, the author will tell us that how the shepherd is completely in tune with his surroundings, how he has acquired all the knowledge required for his occupation and in the course of this weave that he constructs between the shepherd and the natural context, Wordsworth will be able to impart to us a sense of wonder, a sense of joy and a sense of exultation that he has for this beautiful locale where Michael lives. Also he would tell us about the parts of uh, Michael's occupation and how he spends his day in a very industrious and hard-working manner. So let's discuss Michael by William Wordsworth. Wordsworth continues to describe the qualities that Michael possesses and he says hence had he learned the meaning of all winds of blasts of every tone and oftentimes when others he did not he heard the south make subterraneous music like the noise of bagpipers on distant highland hills so he says that Michael because he had been living and working in these surroundings exactly knew what the wind meant was there bad weather to come or was there rain to be expected or was it to be a storm that was going to hit him and his flock of sheep so michael really absolutely was in tune with the rhythms of the nature and then uh, he uses a metaphor from navigation and he says that he understood the blasts of every tone so navigation a horn is blasted in a certain manner to be able to convey certain messages and this is how precisely Michael could interpret all the music that he heard in nature whether it was the wind that made the sound whether it was the rustling of leaves or whether it was his flock behaving in a certain way every noise that came to him Michael could understand it and he also when others could not notice it when others he did not he heard the south make subterraneous music sub under terra earth so from under the earth also he could hear rumblings any kind of sound any kind of message that nature was giving to Michael did not go unnoticed others could have simply not noticed such things and uh, like sometimes when you're traveling through the highland hills and you hear some people playing the bagpiper at a distance and you would recognize the music this is how the music of nature was recognized by Michael he, he makes a very subtle point here that we when we listen to musical instruments instruments believe that we are actually exposing ourselves to art and culture and here he's saying that the sounds of nature were like perceiving art for Michael and later on also he would say that we should never think that it's only poets and literatures and philosophers or people who are in the business of aesthetics who can actually appreciate the beauty that exists in nature simple people like Michael have a stronger sense of this connect of this beauty and of the music and this is a uh, at this point it's the first time that he makes this comment so Michael heard the music of nature the shepherd at such warning of his flock bethought him and he to himself would say the winds are now devising work for me so sometimes when he would hear uh, some noise uh, either from under the earth or of the winds he would know that perhaps there's going to be a storm or perhaps things are not going to be as normal and he would have to put in work either to protect his uh, flock of sheep or maybe the storm or the happening would leave some work in its wake and he would have to do some maintenance some repair work or some kind of um, uh, getting over this particular event that nature would present him with so devising work he would hear the noises and, and he would think that okay nature now wants me to work harder 
and truly at all times the storm that drives the traveler to a shelter summoned him up to the mountains so this was the difference between a common man and michael you know there would be such a storm that if you expect did it to come you would go and quickly seek shelter but here was Michael he would go up the hill so he was ready to face whatever nature threw at him and he was always um, on the lookout because he knew that if he's not prepared if he's not given uh, his foresight if he's not using it then he might have to suffer devastating consequences so he was never scared of storms but the moment he heard that something was gonna strike he prepared himself and walked up the hill he didn't see shelter he started to understand that now was the time for hard work he had been alone amid the heart of many thousand mists that came to him and left him on the heights so it was not an existence where you could summon a whole community to help you no he knew that he would have to brave the storm alone and for many a times thousands of times he had been alone in the mists that surround you in the mountains and uh, on the heights and they would greet him and then leave him alone so lived he till his 80th year was past so he was 80 years old now and this what this was how his life had panned out and thusly the, that man errs who should suppose that the green valleys and the streams and rocks were things indifferent to the shepherd's thoughts so I told you that uh, Wordsworth would stress that Michael the shepherd was very conscious that he lived in a beautiful rewarding place and he would appreciate these valleys and rocks and hills around him so Wordsworth says you would err you would commit a mistake and in that a large mistake and grossly the man errs you would commit a mistake if you were to suppose that Michael did not notice the beauty of the landscape that he existed within fields where with cheerful spirits he had breath the common air hills which with vigorous step he had so often climbed which had impressed so many incidents upon his mind of hardship skill or courage joy or fear so he knew these hills around him he knew the air that he had been breathing all these years and all these experiences had made certain imprints on his mind these imprints were colored either with the emotion of happiness or with the emotion of fear or sometimes when he would have to summon bravery courage and sometimes when he would have to show skill so there was a lot of experience within him of having lived through this wondrous landscape but at the same time a challenging world vicinity which like a book preserved the memory of the dumb animals whom he had saved had fed or sheltered linking to such acts the certainty of honorable gain now like a like a book preserves information his mind was this memory book which had preserved all the experiences that he'd had living in his cottage and caring for his flock of sheep so the dumb animals are the flock of sheep here and he had sometimes saved them sometimes he fed them sometimes he sheltered them and whenever he did such an action he felt it was very honorable to do so because here the author is trying to say that Michael was proud of the profession that he was following he did it with a lot of joy and dedication those fields those hills what could the less have has laid stronghold on his affections were to him a pleasurable feeling of blind love the pleasure which there is in life itself these fields these hills he loved immeasurable immeasurably he loved them and he loved them so much that uh, it was almost blind love so he wouldn't see the challenges they present him with rather he felt that this is what life should be and this is what life should comprise of so there was this pleasure in life that he took to be the shepherd that he was in the hills that he inhabited his days had not been passed in singleness so he didn't really completely live alone but he had a family his helpmate was a comely matron old though younger than himself full 20 years so there was a wonderful lady by his side a matron and uh, she was younger to him by 20 years but they had lived their life together she was a woman of stirring life whose heart was in her house two wheels she had of antique form this large for spinning wool that small for flat and if one wheel had rest it was because the other was at work she was a woman of stirring life 
Stunning is an interesting word to use here. Wordsworth is wanting to say that not even one moment in his life, in her life, was without labor. She was constantly doing the task that was required of her to assist Michael in his work as a shepherd and to have their house together, to run their house together. So she had two wheels. One was to spin wool. So Michael would card wool that he would shear from the sheep and his wife would then take this wool, uh, the pieces of wool and would produce the thread that would then go to maybe uh, an industry or a place where they would make some garments out of that wool. So she had a spinning wheel but the author says she had two. The second wheel was of flax. Flax is a plant and uh, it is a very useful plant. We know uh, most commonly the flax seeds that we eat for uh, health benefits. Now its stock is used to generate fiber from which the fabric called linen can be woven. So you can also run a wheel to generate these fibers from flax. So she had a wheel, one that could spin wool and the other one that could spin flax. And uh, the author says that if one wheel was at rest, it was only because the other was at work. So which is to say in a roundabout manner that the woman never had a free moment to herself. She was constantly at work. Either she was spinning wool or she was spinning flax. The pair had but one inmate in their house. An only child who had been born to them when Michael, telling over his years, began to deem that he was old in Shepherd's phrase with one foot in the grave. This only son with two brave sheepdogs tried in many a storm the one of an inestimable worth made all their household. So it was their son who lived with them and then there were two dogs these brave sheep dogs and they were very useful for Michael their worth could not be estimated they had helped Michael so much in the job that he was doing in the hills that he lived at so this was their household so this was their family that they lived within having described the household comprising of the couple their sheep dogs and of course their lovely son Wordsworth goes on to say I may truly say that they were as a proverb in the whale for endless industry when the day was gone and from their occupations out of doors the son and the father were home were come home even then their labor did not cease what's what says here that this family was made for endless industry for endless effort for endless diligent labor day in and day out they were constantly busy doing something to keep their lives in order to be able to meet the expectations of the occupation that they were in to be able to simply live out their existence there was so much of labor to be done since the moment they woke up in the morning and here he says that even when the day was done and they would come home and they were now very tired they would not really stop doing their their work the work would not cease cease means stop so the work would not stop and there was only a little while in the day when the work would stop and that was when they sat down to eat their meal and when they sat down together to eat this meal Wordsworth says that was the only time they had respite from their daily labor cleanly supper board so the supper board would be very clean laid out with the food and their food was very simple it was pottage a simple stew which is sometimes made from meat sometimes from vegetables and then they had skimmed milk which means that the cream had been taken away from the milk and then they had some cakes made of oat and so this was the simple meal that they would have every day and sometimes some homemade cheese as well yet when the meal was ended Luke for so the son was named and his old father both betook themselves to such convenient work as might employ their hands by the fireside. So Wordsworth has already told us that their labor just wouldn't end in the daytime and the only time they had free was the time when they were eating dinner. So even when the meal was over they would take on some 
work and this was the work that they could do by the fireside sitting indoors the fire was lit they live in a very cold um, uh, country and uh, they felt that they needed to do some work which would then help them to do their occupation better the next day and then what was this work one he says that they would card wool perhaps to card wool for the housewife's spindle or repair some injury done to sickle flail or scythe or other implement of house or field what is it to card wool wool when uh, it's taken from the sheep it is in a form that it needs to be brought into an unentangled form so that it can be used by someone working on the spindle or the spinning wheel so to prepare the wool for further processing is called carding it has to be unentangled and made into small parts maybe and then it can be put to use on the spinning wheel or the spindle now spindle is a small handheld uh, instrument it is a slender rod and it has a tapering end and it is used for uh, hand spinning so either they would card wool for the housewife so that she could spin uh, wool with it on the spindle or they would repair their farm implements now three farm implements wordsworth names here the first one is the sickle he says the sickle uh, maybe was damaged during the day's work now a sickle is a simple farming tool it has a semicircular blade to it and a short handle or maybe it was the flail that had been damaged now the flail is a threshing tool threshing when you are separating the grain from the corn or from other uh, other crops now this uh, flail has a wooden staff and then it has a stick which hangs with it it's a heavy stick that hangs with it and it flails around when you move the staff and the third implement that he names is the scythe scythe is also uh, a farm implement that is used uh, to cut the crop sometimes even to mow the grass now it has a curved blade and it's it is it is at the end of a long wooden staff so these three tools uh, he names here so this was what was their activity when the father and the son would come home they did not have a minute free in their uh, in their lives even before they went to bed these were the activities that they were involved in and then he says down from the ceiling by the chimney's edge that in our ancient uncouth country style with huge and black projection over browed large space beneath as duly as the light of the day grew dim the housewife hung a lamp now from the ceiling the housewife would hang a lamp and that lamp would be lit when the day's light would become less would grow dim and the construction of the house the way the chimney was it was as it was done in rural households there was nothing very modern or very uh, uh, i would say complex about it it was in a simple style he almost uses the word uncouth which is uh, not a very positive word in the way we use it nowadays but it is to generally denote that it was a uh, an existence which was ruddy an existence which was not very nice and prim and proper but which was rural which was frugal and uh, she would hang this lamp it was an aged utensil so they had used it for very many years which had performed service beyond all others of its kind early at evening did it burn and late surviving comrade of uncounted hours it would start early in the evening and it would burn till late this was the comrade of uncounted hours comrade their friend their uh, their uh, confidant almost that they could depend on someone who helped them do what they wanted to do and for uncounted hours for a for an unaccounted length of time which you couldn't measure the lamp had been used so it was a very old thing that the family possessed and every evening this lamp would uh, be lit by the housewife and they would do their work by the lamp's light the author would soon tell us what is the significance of this light which going by from year to year had found and left the couple neither gay perhaps not cheerful yet with objects and with hopes living a life of eager industry what's what here says that when people live such a poor life such a hard working life a life that is filled with labor perhaps they don't really find happiness they're not cheerful about their life but still they have hope in their hearts so that industry or their labor is eager industry and now when luke had reached his 18th year there by the light of this old lamp they sat father and son while far into the night the housewife plied her own 
peculiar work. So when the lamp was lit in the evening, it wasn't really soon enough that they put the lamp off. No, it was for a long time that one could see this light emanating from their cottage because they worked for a long time even before they went to bed. The housewife was doing her own work on the spinning wheel or on the spindle and Luke and his father were sitting by the fireside tending to their uh, own things. Making the cottage through the silent hours murmur as with the sound of summer flies. So there was a murmur of like summer flies. Uh, you could hear the instruments that the housewife was working on or maybe the father and the sun were working on and like you hear summer flies uh, on a silent night similarly you could hear this voice coming from the cottage this light was famous in its neighborhood and was a public symbol of the life that the thrifty pair had lived Wordsworth says that the light from this lamp was famous in the neighborhood. The neighborhood knew that in early evening this lamp would be lit and it would give its light till late in the night and so they knew that this was this very hard-working thrifty couple that lived in this cottage and they had to work this late into the night to be able to conduct the business of their lives. So this light was famous in the neighborhood and he tells us also the reason by telling us the exact site on which the cottage was located. This light was famous in the neighborhood and was a public symbol of the life that the thrifty pair had lived for as a chance their cottage on a plot of rising ground stood single with large prospect north and south high into Eastdale up to Dunmail Rays and westward to the village near the lake. So their cottage was on a high ground and there weren't any houses right next to the cottage. There was a lot of space whether you would look north or south or west and he says uh, he names the villages or the regions that lay near to the cottage but not really adjacent to it and therefore when you see something at a distance from you and at a high ground you look up to it. So the entire neighborhood would look up to this cottage and they would see this light and it became a symbol of hard work and of this couple who lived there and were tending to their life with this great care, patience and labor. So he says that from this constant light so regular and so far seen the house itself by all who dwelt within the limits of the whale both old and young was named the evening star so the people in the neighborhood would call this cottage the evening star because the light would come on in the cottage every evening at the same time and it was uh, the lamp was on for a very long time into the night everybody would look up to it and they named the cottage the evening star with this, we come to the end of the second video of uh, the poem Michael. In the next video, we shall learn what happens now in Michael's life that upsets the entire tenor of his peaceful existence. So I'll see you in the third video. Thank you.